Stuff. All right, all right, let's get in here. Scooty, scooty, scooty. Welcome to the Sunday live stream. Thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's uh, go over uh, some things. Peter's turning off some background noise. Or he's here. He, he, getting in most of it. Either way. Uh, no, yeah, no. You'll see him run by in the background. All right, we're going to go over a couple of uh, things here and uh, have some fun. Have some fun. Uh, first up, what do we got going on at Genus? Well, we threw on a new West Coast IPA literally just last night. Uh, pretty darn classic on that. A lot of sea hop flavors. We did ferment it out. Ooh, there he is. Fermented out with uh, Lutra instead of uh, American Ale yeast, and that was pretty awesome. Done in like seven days, on tap, carved up, ready to go. Fantastic. Enjoying that. Uh, we got a video out on our second channel. For those of you that don't know about it, Genus Not Brewing, go follow it. I mean, maybe after the live stream. Don't leave the live stream to go follow it. But we got a second channel out. Uh, not Brewing, obviously, that's going to be some stuff that we do that's not about brewing. All the fun stuff that we do, we'll leave all the good educational stuff on this channel and then just watch us have some fun over there on that channel. Uh, we're gonna have a video coming up on that pretty soon. Um, yeah, so we're going to be doing our newest, uh, our newest Willet beer that Tim and I are battling head to head, making some plus beer. Octopus, that is. Yeah, that. Um, we're going to be battling head to head uh, in that, and that's going to be uploaded on our Genus Not Brewing channel first. We're really trying to see if we can get a channel that uh, pushes forward the entertainment content before the um, the educational content. Because right now, when we put those kind of videos out on our current channel, for whatever reason, it seems to be dampened a little bit. So, uh, real quick, why don't you guys all let us know how we are sounding? If we've got everything good, if Tim's mic is close enough to his face for it needs to move it. Um, Boom, now you can see the chat. Oh, I got the... Oh, you oh, got it on okay. the phone? Well... Oh, cool. I brought my computer. I guess your phone works, too. We'll do it both ways. That way, I have... We'll see so many chats. ...not to see it. <laughs> All the chats. Um, um, what else we got on the, on the news? So, uh, yeah, video out on the second channel. We will be doing some, uh, um, some fun things that are sort of beer educational. I feel like... Uh, um, but educational entertainment way. The next uh, thought that we had besides the Willet beer stuff is going to be a um, blind tasting the same style of beer, but buying an expensive bottle versus a cheap bottle of the same beer. Um, so things like that. If you guys got ideas, leave them in the comments. We would love to get uh, more content that's not just here's what we know about this topic and a little bit more like here's us having fun with beer and also showing you how our range of knowledge kind of plays into all that. Ooh, talking about having fun with beer. I'll be right back. Hey, we have uh, also beer. 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 If I quit fighting with this chair, Jesus. Our floors are extra st <laughs> sticky tonight <laughs> for no reason. No reason. We let Shay close, and all of a sudden our floors are super sticky. I wonder what went on there. <laughs> all right. Um, and, uh, yeah, so second, uh, Will It Beer is going to be released on that channel. Uh, before we get into our, because I need I need somebody else for the jingle. Before we get into our next time, when you get back, when you get back, okay. <laughs> um, uh, our second part of this live stream. Um, let us know what you're thinking. If you have ideas for um, things that can be educational but are a little bit more geared towards the entertainment side. Um, like I said, we kind of want to branch out with a lot of these things. So. Let us know. And now, it's a, you know the jingle, right? Uh, <laughs> beer of the week. Something like that. All right, I'll do it by myself first. All right. Like a jackass. And then you can follow through. This and you is can, my plan the whole you're time. You're going to have to harm harmonize <laughs> on the second one. Our next segment is our beer of the week. Bum, bum, bum. Beer of the week. Pew. And then you can come up with like a different like ending song. Yeah. You ready, uh, you're, you're ready for that? Let me turn the volume down on this. That was... Interesting. Oh, you were hearing yourself slash me at the same time? Yeah, I was hearing you sing it. It was nice, though. I got it twice. That <laughs> way I'll for sure remember what it is. Jingle's right? so nice, you hear it twice. You know, yeah, what's, that's, right. that's, that's what's right. good. All right, you ready? You ready? Let's do it. Beer, beer of the week. Bum, bum, bum. Beer of the week. Beer. 
Nailed it. That was perfect. I mean, <laughs> like we've been doing it the whole time. Exactly. <laughs> and this week's beer of the week is a, we're going to do a pseudo Belgian IPA. And we're doing this because there's a couple different things that we want to highlight. Specifically, uh, malts. No, not malts. I mean, malts too. But yeah. specifically hops and yeast that we haven't highlighted yet on the channel. Um, <laughs> yeast in the Beast says, nice song. My ears are hardly hurt. Uh, Nailed it. <laughs> definitely. That was our goal. That was our goal. Uh, and this week's beer of the week is a pseudo Belgian IPA. So uh, pseudo Belgian IPA, for those of you who don't know, a Belgian IPA is basically a normal IPA that can bring, be brought a little bit into the juicy world, but is still mostly West Coast style hops. Um, and a lot of the extra fruitiness that balances those West Coast style hops actually come from yeast expression. And so we've got a couple different uh, fun ways to uh, kind of put forward that yeast expression today. And uh, uh, the hops on a, a Belgian style IPA, the nice thing about those is they don't have to be those same, uh, you know, high American or New Zealand style punchy hops um, because the yeast is going to offer a nice fruitiness to kind of add to the whole dynamic. Yeah, actually, one of the best uh, IPAs that we've had in here was a Belgian IPA that was hopped with very low alpha acid, non, well, and I guess non-American traditional hops. It was uh, Bramling Cross and a butt ton of EKGs, East Kent Goldings. And it was phenomenal the way that the yeast brought that out. I also add in there, I tend to find that Belgian IPAs tend to be on the uh, dry side too either from uh, simple sugar additions or uh, just really fermenting it out dry because most belgian yeast are highly attenuable i did yeah sweet uh, it's simple sugars belgian candy sugar or maybe even uh i am hearing myself on my phone as well that was also trippy uh belgian candy sugar or dextrose honey uh, I could even see something like maple syrup going in there using some of those oaky, woody hops would be really, really nice. Yeah. Actually. Um, so with, uh, yeah, with those dry kind of bodies, you know, uh, a lot of times dry bodies is really pungent, especially pungent, aggressive, classic West Coast style hops. Um, like let's say a, a drier beer with Chinook, uh, on the palate, that's not going to feel really good. And so a lot of times mm -hmm. a softer hop, especially hops that have really, uh, unique aromatic complexes can, uh, can really suit those styles of beers. Uh, but you are leaning on some esterification to build that perception of sweetness with the yeast that you're using. So before yeah. we get into that, let's talk about our malts of the week, knowing that these beers can be a little bit on the drier side, especially if you're using some simple sugars. Um, what's the malt of the week? Why are we using that? Oat malt. Uh, here's a malt that I actually think is very underrated, especially in the new world, uh, new brewing world now. Most people are going for flaked oats, and I understand why, because I absolutely love them. Uh, but oat malt, oat malt doesn't quite give you the haze that uh, flaked oat does on there. It has a higher fat content to it, so it actually makes a little bit of a slicker mouthfeel. And what that does for your beer is it really boosts the body without adding sweetness to it you can have a very dry beer that still has a really big mouthfeel by adding something like oat milk people don't often think about the oily slickness that oats themselves have um, but it is a really key component in well done hazies if it's just a puffy hazy where it starches giving that in your mouth then you miss that slickness that actually complements the fruitiness of the hops yeah uh, it's something that we do all the time with our juicy ipas to get them a lot more clear uh, less hazy for it and really make the uh, sweetness of the hops pop is oat malt. And it, I think it's a great addition. I think that's something that uh, as brewers, we used to use a long time. It kind of fell out of popularity, especially with flaked oats out there. Uh, but it needs to be brought back, dang it. I agree. We use oat malt in, the, in all of our IPAs. Um, I wouldn't, no, not all our IPS. We don't use them in the West Coast, but uh, all of the hazies and all of the juicies, most of the, actually all the Belgians we've done have having it, had it in there too. <laughs> so frazzled at the beginning says, Genus yeah. Not Brewing, all about the love of crystal malts. Uh, That's all we do on Genus Not Brewing channel. Oh, that we will, <laughs> you know what? You know what? I'm not going to promise anything, but something might happen that people have been asking for. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. So let's talk about our, <laughs> our hop of the week. Our hop of the week this week is one that we have only used uh, twice now in on the on our commercial scale. Um, um, Tim does all the only, brewing here at the shop, all the small scale stuff that we do. So. Once we will be using it twice. Um, uh, we will be using it uh, twice pretty soon, and I'm pretty excited about it. that's actually what we're going to talk about a little bit. The first time we used it, though. Oh, amazing. I am blown away by this hop. 
And what is that hop? Barberouge. Bar Bar that was an awkward timing for me. <laughs> I planned that so hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Barberouge, French hop. I like French hops. I'm going to say that out there. Stressel Spalt has been one of my favorite for a lot of things. Again, I think that's an underused region for hops. They're so tasty. But this is a new hop coming out of there. Kind of uh, the French people jumping on the... Uh, I shouldn't say that. <clears throat> The French hop game jumping on the new fruity, juicy hops. You could say happening. it. You could say it. I mean, they're on pretty much the same latitude as a lot of the hop growing areas, but oh, they yeah. haven't uh, really gotten to because they've been more grape and wine, wine growing, growing, which yeah. a lot of the times if you have a hop growing region, there is a wine growing region pretty close to it. It's very, very similar climates. Um, um, yeah, so Barber Rouge is, you know, it is a Streisel Spalt, uh, Streisel Spalt derivative. Streisel Spalt is a really great um, classic. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you use it in like a bearded guard. You can use it in a lot of, honestly, light lagers that are going to present themselves with softer, subtle, fruity notes and not that harsh grassiness that you get off of like a Sazer derivative or any of those noble hops. Um, but Barber Rouge itself is kind of taking that, bringing it into the steroidal range that Americans have done it for the last, you know, 10 years or so and giving it that really strong berry fruit kind of note. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm going to pause in this because we should have probably said this at the beginning. We are drinking a golden ale from uh, one of our fans. Um, they sent it in for us to uh, enjoy. Um, and it's tasting really good so far, actually. actually. This is really uh, nice. And we have a note from him somewhere. Somewhere. We will throw a shout out at, <laughs> if when we, we find, if we find it. it. Yeah, I'm sorry. If you are watching, by the way, uh, hopefully you know who you are that sent in these. Um, I remember getting them and I remember like talking to you on instagram but i also completely forgot who so yeah this is our bad we've it's been a while since we've actually drank on camera and so it's been a while since we've been able to taste some of the beers that have sent in to us uh thank you so much for sending it in and this beer is fantastic it, it is quite nice all right yeah uh so they took this nice stressful spalty hop and bumped it so far up into the fruity range oh jimmy just caught us he what for uh, also, Jimmy asked if we had, if we tried Link Oat Malt yet, and we haven't. But Jimmy just uh, yeah. uh, he you know he's 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 ahead of the game. He's he ahead of going the game. On. Just uh, hang on, Jimmy. Slow down. <laughs> Slow down. All right. Um, so yeah, they booped up. Booped. Up. Yeah, Definitely. they booped it up. Beep. Booped up the uh, berry qualities to this. And the, reading it, smelling it, it's supposed to be red berry, especially strawberry. We got off of that. Uh, some raspberry in there too, a little bit, red currant, like those nice ripe red berry fruits. Uh, pretty awesome. It smelled great. He's like, yeah, this is going to be great. We made a smashy smash beer out of it uh, using some Chevalier malt, which we talked about yep. last week. Uh, that was great, but it's fermenting out exactly like promised. Uh, strawberry fields. Uh, there's a huge floral uh, quality in there too that wasn't described in the uh, flavor description, but 100% reminds me of Stressel Spalt. But I mean, when I say strawberry fields, it's literally like walking through a fields of strawberry flowers and then eating some of the fruit along the way in a beer. Yeah, and one thing to note about this is it is a lower total oil content hop just in general. And so if you're using this, you definitely don't want to use it as a minor player with big hops like Galaxy or Citra or Simcoe. Um, and if you do use it like with one of those hops, make sure that the Barber Rouge is definitely front and center and those hops are kind of playing a complementary background role. Because if this is used in a lower percentage in a beer, it's going to get wiped away pretty quick. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, I mean... Even though we use this in a pale ale, I would say it's an extra pale ale bordering IPA in there. Using this for something like uh, IPO would be awesome. Pilsner, oh, yeah. uh, throwing it into some of your farmhouse ales, especially Saison. We wanted to use this um, in a, uh, we wanted to make Italian Pilsner our beer of the week just because of this hop. But then we decided to go with Pseudo Belgian because we also wanted to talk about the yeast that Jimmy already said out loud. Dang it. Spoiler alert, Jimmy. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, did you already say notes of uh, citri citrus zest and kumquat along with those strong berry notes that come across this, um, giving it some dynamic range too, as well as just that strong berry flavor. So don't expect it to be like, boom, strawberry. It's like balanced strawberry in a fruit yeah. salad. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, getting into our yeast, we're using uh, sundew. Sundew, we've talked about a couple times already. You probably saw it if you watched our Blonde Ale three-way tasting video where we uh, did a uh, Sundew versus Bonanza versus Kaiser experiment all in the same batch of beer. Um, those beers are actually starting to come on tap here. 
And uh, the so far, the Kaiser's just on tap, but now that they've kind of had a little bit more conditioning time, those flavors are coming out even more than during that orig original tasting. So uh, yeah. one thing to note about sundew is it is a yeast that I would say you want to err on the warm side of fermentation now. Oh, definitely. Uh, like most, most Belgian strains out there, the warmer you ferment it, the more of those phenols and esters and deliciousness is going to come out of it. Sundew not actually having the phenol gene on it kind of, for me, means that we need to bump this up a little bit, bump the temperature up a little bit to get the esters more uh, productive and more presentable in there because you are missing a little bit of it. But because of that, you get all the good fruity stuff. Yeah, and uh, uh, you don't run the risk as you would with a lot of, uh, you, you know, a lot of Belgian strains of getting that high clove fennel, even with the warm fermentation, because usually that 75 degree range does produce some nice esterification, but it gets to that point where um, where that clove fennel just pops really, really hard, and so that warm yeah. fermentation is actually a little bit safer now that that uh, phenol is clipped. Yes, definitely. Which I am testing to the extreme with a beer that I have going in the back right now because it started at like a 90 degree fermentation and let it drop to 80 degrees. So we'll yeah. see if we get some high alcohols or whatever, but. Definitely. Uh, all right, uh, water chem for this. Uh, water chem is going medium hard. I mean, you're kind of trying to replicate uh, Belgian water. Uh, I would honestly say maybe a little bit closer to the Alsace region. Uh, so your medium hardness will have a little bit more sulfates in it and what, less less chlorine, less calcium. Less chlorides, yeah. Less uh, chlorides. So it'd be like uh, you, you, nothing's going to be super, super high, so it's not going to be like Burton on Trent in any, in any range. But you can have some uh, bicarbonates and calciums in those 120 uh, to 100, kind of that range. Uh, and then the uh, sulfates and chlorides. Compared to here in Spokane, where a lot of times our sulfates and chlorides are both down in like the 10 parts per million range, uh, and something like this, you can have them both up in that 50 to 60 degree range, maybe just barely leaning to the sulfates, give a little bit more hardness on it. Um, but there's, uh, there's a lot of ways you can take this as long as you don't go uh, too soft so it's not like a pilsner. You really want to be pushing some of those, um, those aggressive tones and the textures that are going to push forward the hops. And you want to make sure that there's something in the water, you, but you don't want it to be Burton on Trent aggressive. No, that, that's with far too aggressive, especially because you'll have a lot more delicate hops than the brewers on the Burton on Trent use. Well, yeah. delicate beer, I guess I should say. Delicate overall. Delicate. You want to get your mic a little closer to your face. Mic closer to my face, probably because I scooted back away. That could be it. Yeah. Can you raise it? You want me to raise it for you? No, oh, it's all right. I mean, I think. <laughs> I'm going to put it right next to your face. Oh, this is going to be great. This is giving me back for the earlier awkwardness. <laughs> Actually, it's quite comfortable. It's like a blinder. Now I don't pay attention to this side of the shop. But uh, that is pretty much it for our beer of the week. If you guys got questions on the Belgian IPA, if you got questions on Barber Rouge, on uh, Sundew, let us know in the comments. Uh, we'll try to get those. And if we don't get them during the live stream, we will definitely try to hit those uh, um, at the end of the uh, podcast when we do the, uh, the Q&A. Yeah. So let's go on to our topic number one, which this is something that is kind of a, a hard topic to approach. Um, and that is when should you not use a yeast starter? The reason this is hard is because we, if you were to ask us, when do I need a yeast starter? No matter what your alcohol percentage, no matter what your beer style, we will almost always say you should do a yeast starter. It's consistency. Yeah. Yeast starters are great, they're phenomenal. You make sure that your yeast is actually up, live, and going, and gonna survive and whatever you throw it in there. I mean, is it 100% absolutely necessary on every beer? No, and that's uh, actually what this is for. But you should almost always do a yeast starter because you care about your beer and you want it to taste good. Exactly, it's, it's giving you that consistent frame of mind where every time you're adding your yeast to your beer, it's going to ferment in a consistent way because you have yeast that's already started and it, regardless of cell count, your yeast is already going. And what that does is it reduces lag phase. Lag phase is a time depending on your system where reactive oxidant species can be created, uh, where there's a potential for infection because your yeast haven't taken over the environment yet and become competitive. Um, so reducing that lag phase is always going to reduce variables in your beer. Um, and that's, that's really just the biggest reason why a, a starter is consistently recommended by us. But let's talk about some times where you might want to 
uh, not use a yeast starter because it might create a better fl flavor if you don't, or, or even um, just times where that yeast starter is probably not necessary. So if you forget about it, there's no sweat off your skin. I do know something that uh, we forgot to add in there, no yeast starter, but we'll get into it. Perfect. All right. Oh, yeah. Here's a fun fact for you, just for Reverend KY. Macaulay Culkin believed that the uh, uh, Angels with Filthy Souls movie in Home Alone was real for almost his entire life. Fun facts with Timothy. I should have had him do it. <laughs> fun facts with Timothy. There you go. Sound a little bit more like the actual jingle. Yeah. All well, right. You, you guys don't know how much that gets sung across here in the brewery, just like when we're hanging out. <laughs> Uh, and yes, Reverend you, <laughs> KY, you are right. Omega definitely, uh, definitely did that. Uh, uh, all right. Let's talk about, so the first time, at, well, let's talk about a general rule of when yeast starters are probably not necessary and sometimes can even make a better beer without yeast starters. As a general average, anytime that you want to be fermenting your, uh, your beer hot, a yeast starter is probably not as necessary. Yeah, uh, this includes uh, high fermented Belgian ales, uh, some of the German ales go up there. The Quike, Quike, Quike specifically, is in there. I mean, Quike is probably the one that, unless you're really trying to ferment something fast and clean, you should not do a yeast starter because it ends up being more expressive uh, when you has a very very little pitch in there. Mm -hmm. um, what was it? We've had a couple of people talk about like a tablespoon or a teaspoon. It's teaspoon of slurry yeah, per very small amount. five gallon to really get some of them to express. We have done a straight up quike pitch with, I want to say two packets of, of uh, uh, Lutra, not Lutra, um, uh, the uh, Loki, Loki. Uh, two yeah. packets of Loki on a five barrel batch. Um, when we're using to do that successfully, a lot of nutrient is needed, first of all. Uh, but we've done a two pack of Loki and a five barrel batch, knowing that we're going to be pushing that temperature up to the 95 to 100 degree range. And mm -hmm. we want that yeast to just go ham. So a lot of nutrients is going to be needed because that yeast will still be multiplying during fermentation. Uh, but aggressively. But it is a, it, it's, uh, first of all, a great money saver to not have to add more yeast <laughs> yeah. and I'll not have to do the starter. And it also tends to ferment that beer even quicker because it doesn't have to go through the normal uh, normal lag and log okay. phase that a uh, yeast would. So French Chaison yeah. yeasts, uh, uh, oh, Quike yeah. yeasts especially, especially. Uh, and a lot of the Belgian strains. Uh, starters are, you're basically using temperature, temperature for the energy of activation. So the colder your fermentation, think of lagers, I think is the perfect example. Perfect, perfect the example. more uh, a, 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 a starter is going to be super necessary uh, because they need that push. But when you have heat applied, you're adding energy to the system and that actually affects how aggressive the yeast can go and how far they can go. Um, again, anytime you're fermenting warm with a low pitch, a lot of nutrient necessary. Anytime you're fer fermenting cold, er, the more a yeast starter is probably gonna be necessary. Yeah. Uh, yeast and beast, it's actually because he ran out of tank tops. It's laundry day. It is. Uh, so, uh, you know, along <clears throat> with that is strong aromatic fermenters, which also tends to happen at high temperatures. Yeah. Again, breaking into the Saison. So it's French Saison, especially in that comes to mind. That yeah. thing loves to go till real high temperatures and <laughs> ferment everything. Uh, Belgian Saison, a lot of people don't expect this because Belgian Saison is a sleepy beaver. Belgian oh, Saison yeah. will stall out on you all the time. But if you do it properly, without a starter, you can add a lot of nutrients and make sure you're fermenting that thing at 78 degrees, which is above even the recommended temperature. Um, the Belgian Saison actually does better on secondary pitches as well, which is kind of part of the same uh, line of thinking. Uh, but Belgian Saison, if you ferment really, really hot, uh, it produces the better esters than if you were to do a low fermentation temperature without a starter. Yeah. Uh, Brett, Britanniumyces. Br yeah, Britanniumyces I mean, is one of those ones that's like, it's, it's, it's the... Uh, even at low temperatures, it's going to low and slow your beer. Uh, so you never need to do a starter with Brett unless you really need to build up some sort of a pitch. So if you're doing a pure pitch of Brett or if you're doing a pitch of, uh, you know, a mixed culture or whatever, um, even if that yeast packet is six to eight months old, there's Brett in there. If you're planning on letting your beer age, there's no need to do a starter. No. Uh, again, this is not universal on it. If you, are do if you want to do a normal two-week fermentation Brett IPA 100%, 
you build really, up a good starter, yeah. make sure you get it going. But if you're in there doing a mixed culture on it or throwing bread on the back of, you know, a Berliner Weiss or even a, as a secondary pitch into it, it's a secondary yeast, there's, I mean, you almost have, need to wave the bag over it and you'll have Brett in there that's going to take over. Yeah. Um, and especially if you're going to be aging it like in closed systems at the end, all your carbonation is going to come from there. Um, you know, barrel pitches, uh, like we use, we, uh, uh, some of our best sours that we've made have been a mixed culture with Brett, um, which kind of preludes to another thing we're going to go into. Um, but yeah, that Brett takes over and that beer dries out. We go straight wort into a barrel, uh, with a mixed culture, single packet, and we just let it ride out for, you know, a year or something like that. And it ends up being good in the end. You just have to have faith at that point. You're relying on time to get the job done. Brett's a super strong across the board. Brett is a super strong bug and it's not going to have the death rate that Saccharomyces does. Uh, and so, whereas you, you know, Saccharomyces basically, you know, it dies at a rate of like a half every three months or something like that or four months. Oh. Uh, uh, I don't know yeah. for you what its half-life is. A half-life every four months. Uh, bread is way slower, so it's just a strong beast. Um, and you can you can make good beers just by adding bread to your beer and letting it ride out. There's been hundred plus year old bottles that have been found that oh. still have live bread. Bread. It's crazy. Yeah. They, they metabolize so many things. I mean, it's the garbage goat. It eats everything. That garbage goat's a Spokane reference, but uh, yeah, it's the garbage goat. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, hey, I mean, Brett's the goat of the brewing world. Everybody knows that. That's common knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here's another one for <laughs> you. And I see this all the time, actually, on the Internet. And it's kind of one of those A lot of people talk about margins. That's a, yeah, that's yeah, a joke from, 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 from stuffs. From, from stuffs. <laughs> um, mixed cultures from dregs. Growing up a yeast starter from dregs. Uh, it's not always a bad idea, but what you need to know is you're not going to get the same yeast proportions that went into those dregs. So you're not growing the same mixed culture. That's, all right, that's my soapbox for that. I'm going to pour a beer, let Peter get into this. <laughs> um, so uh, the thing with mixed cultures, and this is especially like if you're going from dregs, so you have bottle dregs. There's a couple different ways to go into this. We'll start with an actual mixed culture where the bottle dregs, imagine the beer is bottled right off of the barrel where you have every single bacteria that's in there um, acting equally, right? Uh, if you do a starter, chances are your Saccharomyces strain, depending on the Saccharomyces strain, is going to outcompete every other bacteria or yeast in that starter. And your Saccharomyces will basically inhibit everything that made that beer good. Uh, Reverend, how are you going to stall him? He's just a vacuum. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. Stealing. I'm guessing he meant stealing. But uh, oh, I know yeah. he meant stealing, but, you know, he said stalling, and I'm wondering how you're going to stall the garbage go. <laughs> just turn, uh, just uh, stop pressing the button. button. Block off the button. Oh, you got to throw something large in there. <laughs> Go down there and take your pen. Okay, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, super uh, large. Uh, all right, back uh, to mixed culture dregs. So mixed culture dregs, uh, first of all, uh, there are different bacteria that will grow better in aerobic versus anaerobic conditions. So one of the first and I think most obvious things to talk about is the fact that bacteria, or so bacteria specifically lactobacillus, won't grow in aerobic conditions. And so if you're trying to grow your yeasty beasties in a normal stir plate style starter, you're going to be growing your Saccharomyces first because Britannomyces grows way Thanks. slower. Um, and so your Saccharomyces is probably going to take over the entire environment. It's going to get competitive and you're going to still have some Brett and still have some bacteria in there, but uh, it's going to be very, very inhibited. And so if you use that as a primary pitch in a new beer, you might not even get any flavor. And there are some strains, specifically French Saison, that are killer strains. They will outcompete everything else in that starter. So mixed culture, especially from dregs where you have limited amounts of each style of thing in there, you cannot build that up as a starter by itself. There's a raspberry milkshake IPA in the fridge. Did you guys get the raspberry milkshake IPA I sent? I'm <laughs> hoping so. What's a name the cap color on it and we will find it. Okay. We have we haven't tasted any of the beers that have been sent to us for since the last one that we tasted on a live stream. So name the cap color, that'll be our next beer. Red cap. Cool. Red cap. Awesome. Happening I'll go next. Look for it and I'm sorry it took this. I'm sorry it took so long to drink it. Yeah. Uh all right. Blaine Logan. So, and that's the thing. This is the thing that uh, on the internet, it's one of those things that I see all the time. People, we were drinking an IPA from the same person who sent in the golden ale. Uh, but that's the thing that, especially when you're doing mixed firm beers, 
understanding the actual fermentation times when things are basically when things are active and strong going in your beer really helps with this. If you are trying to create a true mixed firm beer, creating a starter is basically going to give you Saccharomyces unless you saved it for five years and then it's going to give you Brett. Um, you could also, if you are growing that under a, uh, an anaerobic condition, if you have oxygen in there and your stir plate while you're going, there are some beers where Acetobacter is something that is good inside of it. Flanders Red is one of those. Yeah. And you grow a starter off of that, you might be growing a vinegar starter, which could be delicious, but probably not what you want to ferment your beer with. Hey, malt vinegar, you know, I'm all about it. Mm, yes, yes. Uh, so, and on that as well, not all of these mixed culture <laughs> beers actually have the mixed culture in the bottle. Uh, a lot of them do pasteurize their beers first or wait for a minute and kill off most of the yeast and then carbonate them with champagne yeast. So you might just be growing up a champagne starter. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, honestly, it's a more shelf stable and more viable uh, for distribution method of brewing. And so it's not a bad thing that these brewers are doing this. What they say when, when they're saying basically when they do this champagne yeast starter to make their uh, or champagne culture to get their carbonation, what they're saying is I made the beer so that it is perfect when I leave my brewery and I don't want it to change from there. So it's just two different methods to basically bottle your beer if you do, you know, sour or mixed culture beers. Um, for, for us on our small scale, that'd probably be the smarter way for us to package our beer. Um, just because there's a lot of changes that can happen after it leaves the brew house. We sell beer when we know it tastes good. Basically, that means if we have a sour culture going in a barrel, we taste it until it tastes good, and then we put it on tap. So if yeah. we were to try to put that out in the distribution, the smarter thing for us to do would be to pasteurize and then champagne carbonate. But that means for you guys, if you're trying to do a starter off those dregs, you're startering champagne, champagne yeast. yeast. Yeah, so that's, that is something that you should look out for. There are some good lists out there. Uh, the Milk the Funk Wikipedia actually has a ton of the popular guys, whether they pasteurize, uh, what their bottle dregs actually are, if it's champagne yeast, if it's something else in there. So just make sure you look at that before you do a mixed culture drag and realize what you are growing. Um, real quick, just to discuss this beer uh, and the, actually both the beers that we talked about. The first beer, uh, super, super good. I loved a, a small mm. grainy malt sweetness that was behind it. Um, uh, kind of low hops. Some of that could have come from how it was made and some of that could have come from mm. uh, from yeah age. Uh, the second beer, there is one thing that I get that's a, an off flavor. So if mm. you're watching, um, let me know. Uh, this does have a polyphenol in it, which could come from your water source. That's the most common way that I see it. Um, or a chlorophenol more specifically. Um, and so that could come yeah. from water source, uh, depending on what it is. If there's chlorine in your water, when a sugar is added, then it creates that chlorophenol, uh, which has got a little bit of like a plasticky hose water flavor. Uh, it's very subtle. Honestly, most drinkers probably wouldn't notice it. Uh, there's but, probably quite a few professional beers on the market that have more of that in there than this does. Yeah. But it is something to look out for. Uh, Overall, the flavor I think is super good. I think the, the flavor, the base. I think in terms of recipe, it tastes like a clean. It tastes like a slightly elevated pale ale. It doesn't taste like quite like, like big IPA, extra but pale ale. Yeah, I would say. Uh, Wiser, uh, not all of the Christmas beers have been drank yet. The persimmon was really tasty. I mean, definitely heavy persimmon. If you don't like that, you don't like that. But that was a really good beer. Thank if, you. Uh, I didn't get to drink that one, by the way. He drank it without me. Uh, you were standing there. I offered you a taste, and you did not taste it. I'm pretty sure I was already drunk, though. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't want to. There might be a second one in there. He gave us two of a bunch of them. So. All right. Thanks, Matt. We appreciate you. Yeah. Also, uh, Jimmy, if you're still watching, I think we still have to taste your mm. barley wine. Uh, yes. So. Oh. I don't know if that's going to happen in this stream because we're going to go with a raspberry, raspberry IPA. IPA. It's important but, to, us get, to get IPAs out of the way as soon as we can. Yes, it is. By the way, thank you so much for 172 of you now watching. Uh, if you guys that are watching can give this video a thumbs up, that would help us out a bunch. Um, let's uh, go on ooh, to... Oh, actually, sorry. This is really good. Uh, Jeff asked this question. Uh, how would you combat uh, chlorophenol flavor? Once it's in there, it's in there. It's one of those ones that doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's not a good way to... Uh, I mean, maybe if you had like a hyper brewery, like centrifuge style filter, it might go out, yeah. but it's, it's really hard on the homebrew scale to get rid of a chlorophenol. It's really easy <clears throat> to prevent it. Boil every single bit of water that you're using. Or use Camden. If, you're, if there's chlor if there's chloramines in your water, use Camden tablets or a carbon filter. Yeah. Um, but 
So, but generally water source. It's a hard one to get rid of though. It's one yeah. of the few things that you can't cure with Brett. Yeah. yeah, you might be able to, if you really, really funk the hell out of it, you might be able to blend it in and you'd be like, huh, this is mostly Brett and sort of hide it, but you can't cure it with Brett. Um, let's go right. on to, um, uh, let's go on to the beers that a lot of people will say you should underpitch that we just disagree with. Yeah. Uh, there's kind of reasons for it, but I think a lot of this is built on uh, tradition rather than actual stuffs, you know? Yeah. So, uh, those beers are going to be the, uh, you know, a lot of the ones that have those strong, uh, phenol producers that we talked about before. Um, it's going to be certain Belgians. Not all Belgians, but certain Belgians. And Hefeweizens is the biggest one that I see. A lot of people are like, I really want that banana flavor. So I'm going to underpitch the hell out of this. The problem with that is the banana flavor is going to be pretty consistent depending on temperature, regardless of pitch. The thing that can happen when you stress that yeast out is the phenol production can be really, really high. And you can run the risk of fusel alcohol. So you'll make a less consistent beer. It's one of those things that sometimes the beer might be amazing and way better, but because you're under pitching, you're adding a lot of variables. And sometimes that beer might be complete crap. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I've said it before too, that some yeast you want to, well, when you stress yeast out, it makes flavor, whether that's good flavor or bad flavor, it makes flavors. Yeah. Stre that's what it does. If you could, really pinpoint and consistently do the same stressing every single time i would say under pitching a belgian or a half yeast to get some of that extra especially uh, a belgian if you're really looking for some of those phenol flavors but at the same time that's not something that we normally can or really want to do as home brewers so it, it's better to create those flavors through heat than it is through low pitches. Better yeah. to have a good and great beer produced in a way that you can repeat every time than risk your beer turning out bad. We already got a, already got a comment. There's some hose in the stout. There's some hose in the stout. Nice. Uh, I agree. Yeah, right. I'm def definitely. definitely. <laughs> um, you guys all ready for topic number two? Raise your hand if you're ready for topic number two. Raise your hand with the thumbs up button if you're ready for topic number two. Topic number two, by the way, is clarifiers. And uh, there's a lot more to these than a lot of people realize. Oh, hang on. Uh, Kiel Jeffrey just asked about underpitching Quake. We did talk about that a little bit earlier. Quake is an exception to that. <clears throat> um, underpitch with a high temperature. If you're fermenting at room temperature, do not underpitch Quake. If it's just in your living room, don't underpitch it. Yeah. If you can get that thing up to 95 degrees and ferment that way the entire time, under pitch and add a ton of nutrients. Also a lot of oxygen. Yeah. Lots. Like All right. Once so every two hours for the second two hours. Don't believe him. Nailed it. But a lot. Let's talk about clarifiers because there's clarifiers, uh, ways to clarify your beer basically that a lot of people don't think about that don't just happen in the – oh, crap, my beer isn't clarified back-end stage. So we're going to start from the beginning and kind of work our way through. Yeah, th there's lots of ways to do this. There's lots of different theories and chemical – well, not chemicals, but you know what I mean. Stuffs to throw into your beer to make it nice, bright, and shiny if you want that. Yeah, uh, on the very first side of things is something that we've talked about for other reasons um, but actually works to clarify your beer, and that's using enzymes on the mash side. Yeah, uh, what that does, depending on the enzymes, is help break down sugars or proteins, things like that. Not only helping out with your mash efficiency as well as a lot of ability, but actual clarification in the end. And that's one of our first ones, Visco Buster. I love Visco Buster. Uh, there are points that you can use Visco Buster and not use rice holes, and you will still get incredible lot of ability out of your mash. It has the ancillary benefit of breaking down beta glucans and some proteins that um, cause haze in final beers. And so by using Visco Buster, not only do you increase your mash efficiency and make uh, for an easier brew day, um, it's also pretty much necessary for what we do, which is an overnight mash. But it will also give you a clearer beer at the end. Yeah. Uh, actually, I just saw this in the comment. I'm going to come back to the dregs. While you shouldn't make a starter on dregs, the best way to use them is actually just direct pitch just chuck those suckers straight in there if you if, use drags, if you're aiming for the bacteria stuff oof, get it in there 
don't start it. All right, back in the Visco. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, one, you're getting way better efficiency off that, but because uh, you're breaking down proteins in the mash, you aren't gonna have them in the boil or in the beer, mm -hmm. which makes for more clear beer. Um, so side note, although we don't always use all enzymes, aside from Visco Buster and all our beers, uh, most enzymes that you're using during mash, let's say OptiMash as well, will actually slightly clarify your beer. And that doesn't necessarily have to do with the alpha amylase or the active ingredient that you're using it for, but some of the other ingredients that are designed to be put in there for increased sugar solubility or even protein solubility. Um, those enzymes basically add active sites to those proteins um, or haze forming starches that make them more soluble and increase your efficiency in your beer, your perceived efficiency in beer. But by adding those active sites or those sites that create it, make them more soluble, they're also making them easier to precipitate out during fermentation. So those can sometimes add some clear, uh, some clarifying to your beer. Not as much as Visco Buster, but there can be a clarifying effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and then other enzymes to actually break down the sugars. Yeah. Like if you have less starches, you have more sugars to ferment out and you get cleaner, crisper beer don't turn into anything else. So, I mean, that one kind of makes sense on there. Definitely. Uh, and we'll talk about one more of those when you get into the actual fermentation clarifiers. Um, uh, hang on. Uh, Tuan Bui. I mispronounced that. I'm sorry. OptiMash is not the same thing as Visco Buster. They are from the same place, White Labs, but yeah. OptiMash is actually an alpha amylase uh, enzyme. Visco Buster is a beta glucan uh, enzyme. Yeah, so the yeah, Visco Buster will break down the proteins and the beta glucans, and OptiMash uh, works as an alpha amylase, uh, but it does have those, it does have separate enzymes in it that, like I said, create higher solubility um, for certain proteins and starches as well. All right. Two different things it does. Uh, boil go, side. Yeah, oh, boil so side. You were going to add something else? No, I was going no. to boil oh, side. There we go. Create, I was bridging the gap. Yeah. Um, everyone's heard about Irish moss. Irish moss is uses the, uh, the active ingredient carrageenan. It's basically natural seaweed that's high in carrageenan. What carrageenan does is it uh, attracts proteins. So proteins at uh, on the boil side have both heat and less acidity than proteins on cold side. So using a boil side finding agent can actually work very, very differently than using a fermentation or cold side finding agent. Yeah, Irish moss <clears throat> tends to be the most popular one out there. We've been using it for ages in the brewing world. It's really nice, easy to use. Chuck it in at 15 minutes. Uh, kind of the same thing, but a little extra added and a little less measuring is whirl flock. Um, whirl flock is refined or it has an extra it's refined yeah, yeah. Well, it's carrageenan tabletized Tablet. um which is super easy you don't have to measure at all you just chuck in a tablet or a half a tablet and away you go uh works in exactly the same way does like, the same stuff yeah yeah super moss super moss is what we use just because super moss is so concentrated yeah so super moss like a tiny tiny amount can go for a seven barrel batch of beer not as cost efficient on the homebrew scale. Uh, like a single one pound jar is like 35 bucks. Mm -hmm. But on the five gallon scale, that one pound jar will last you <laughs> maybe a thousand batches of beer. Yeah. A lot of beer. Uh, I think it ends up being a quarter teaspoon per five gallons or yeah. something like that. It's, it's a really low, ridiculous amount, which for us on the big professional scale is pretty awesome because that means we don't have to use so much. Yeah. And it's relatively cheap if you amortize it out over the number of batches of beer. So uh, Super Moss would probably be my go-to. It's a little bit harder to use than Whirflock, though, because Super Moss, you got to, like, pre-dissolve uh, pre in, like, hot water. Uh, it actually asks you to use uh, hot wort. Hot wort. Or yeah. room temperature wort. Like, room te yeah. Well, yeah, room temperature. Not hot, room temperature. But yeah, but Whirflock is just like a tablet. Boom, right in the boil. Good to go. Good so to that's go. kind of the difference on the boil side clarifiers. All those will serve to give you a good pre-clarification. Um, if you use those, probably the only clarifier you will need on the back end is a silica, but we'll talk about that on the cold side. There's uh, a couple of other natural <clears throat> things that you could also use on the boil side, one of them being lobsters. Yeah, so lobsters we definitely think are the most efficient way to clarify your beer as well as add flavor. Um, they also work great as sparge arms. Um, I saw somebody in the comments before talking about using lobsters as like, instead of rice holes as a separator. Oh yeah. That, 
I mean, that would definitely work for part of it. Yeah, at, at only 20 to $25 per lobster, I think they're a really cost-efficient way to add that clarification step, so. I, in all honesty, the shells in that do contain something that <clears throat> will help clarify with it. Oyster shells, if you have them, or just eat oysters while you are brewing. Most that, bugs. That's something that actually will help clarify as well. It, Those roly pulleys. Mm. That, I mean, I think in their shells, that might actually have something that helps clarify. Anything so. with an exo exoskeleton. Yeah. There we go. All right. Fermentation <laughs> side. What can Fra we add in Fra fermentation? Frazzled Pink Penguin says lobsters are also a good crystal malt substitute. Oh, my God. Yes. You hit on that so hard. All right. <laughs> Half an hour tangent. Yes, they are. It adds that extra nice sweetness to your beer. That's so much better. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, fermentation <laughs> side. Uh, the most common one that you guys have probably seen is called Clarity Firm, and Clarity Firm is the anti-gluten enzyme that you add during fermentation. So if you add that with your pitch, it's guaranteed to reduce your beer's gluten content to less than 10 parts per million. Um, and it didn't start as a gluten reducer. It started because it was a good clarifier. Yeah. Um, everybody should take us seriously as a side note. But yeah. – uh, so it all right. It reduces gluten by pulling those glutens out of uh, the beer, out of fluctuation, yeah. basically for that. And it also pulls out some haze comic, uh, haze forming particles that come from hops, uh, chill haze type particles in there. So this is a little bit different. It, while it says clarity firm, the things that it clarifies out of there is not actually everything that makes it hazy. So don't be surprised if you use clarity firm and it doesn't pull everything out. Also, because of what <clears throat> it does to the glutens in there, you can actually get a little bit extra fermentation out of it. It can create a little bit of a extra fermentability. Yeah, a drier beer, basically. So it is still breaking down haze-forming starches, um, and those haze-forming starches will become... Um, uh, they'll become fermentable depending on the yeast that you use. And so you can get a little bit of a drier beer, but uh, how um, the same company, so Widmer did their omission series, and how yeah. Widmer did the, their omission series for their gluten-reduced beers was with uh, basically Clarity Firm. So that's one way to do it. Um, uh, another way to do it is with Ultra Firm, which is gluco, gluco, glucoamylase or amylo, uh, glucosidase. Man. Yeah. Um. This is another, uh, this is an enzyme that helps break down more starches, excuse me, that helps break down more starches actually inside the fermentation while it's going. And that's what can help cause haze in there. So if it's broken down in the sugars and the yeast eat it, nothing to cause some haze. Yeah. And so you probably know this as the enzyme that uh, makes your uh, brute IPAs, or it's basically just a good enzyme for high alcohol beers, basically. But it is doing the same kind of thing as Clarity Firm would be doing, but on a more aggressive level. Uh, and it is breaking down uh, longer chain sugars, starches, uh, so that they are they become fermentable. Um, alcohol, as you know, pure alcohol is pretty clear, whereas starches are not. And so if you've got something in there that's turning starches into something that yeast can eat and turn into alcohol, then obviously your beer is going to be clearer. Uh, Jimmy, that's actually both of these are kind of <clears throat> what we're talking about in there. Uh, the less filling, uh, if you didn't read it, Jimmy was con uh, said he saw a comment how a brewery <laughs> uses Clarity Firm and sees an increase in sales because they're less filling. Yeah, what that. both of these do is actually, re you know, reduce some of those extra starches, which do create body or filling in beers. So if it's a lot lighter and easier to drink, more you tend to drink more of it. This time, to R. Kelly's chagrin, the body is telling him no. Nah. Now, uh, keep it. in mind, <laughs> but um. Uh, to keep in mind in that, if you are creating a really nice, flavorful big american stout you probably want some body in there um so but again in a stout that's probably not something that you're worried about clarity and so um let's talk about cold side after uh i after i get a you get, uh, red, I, ca red capped beer <laughs> i'll go through and answer a couple and he still thought it less than i did all right, I'll go through and answer a couple of questions if I can. Um, doo, 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 doo. <laughs> uh, you know, Garage Brewing, you are right. The best way to clarify is to distill it, and it comes out stupid clear. So, so, 
Uh, all right, let me go back in here a little bit, see if we can get up into there. Um, do, 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 do. You guys are all talking to each other. There's no questions there. How do we come? Now we already got that. Uh, top tips to make hot flavor really come through. Um, Which one of these is it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's go down there. Peter beat me. Hoots, that's a red lager. Oh, no. Yeah, that's actually Doghouse. That, that's, actually a brewery. That's, a, that's an actual brewery. So I'm guessing it's... Did you he, did he send two? Maybe. If you sent two, then those are them. If anybody recognizes these two bottles, tell us. All right. Well, there's a couple down here. Uh, keg filled for carbonation yesterday. Hey, that's them. Okay. Perfect. Nice. Open uh, them over the sink. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, directly in our face. I definitely like to get squirted in the face with beer. Uh, keg, or carbonating in keg, uh, you know, um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do that. Uh, if you go a higher, higher carbonation equals shorter time, but you have to monitor it more. That way, you know, you don't overcarb it. If you use your actual serving pressure, um, that's one of the ways that I find is the most pleasant, but it does take a little bit of time, a week or two on that. So Wilfred Lopsfilowitz. Just got into brewing and watching your channel has been super informative. So please take my money and keep being rad. Cheers. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Yeah. We always love when people, uh, you know, gain information from us and, and, and are appreciative. And, and it makes us feel good, basically. It does. It makes us feel loved. It makes us feel like what we're doing is reaching out to a lot of people and helping them out. Uh, we do give a lot of our information away for free. Um, that's not just to you guys on YouTube. That's to everyone in the local community. We love being a big part of the community and helping people grow in brewing, both home brewers and commercial brewers. And so, you know, it always makes us excited when people... Uh, Ooh, I see red yeast. That's nice. Uh, here's actually a good one. Uh, the Brew Show. Difference in adding ultra firm and mash uh, and fermentation. I will say that we personally love to add it into mash. The glucoamylase works great at lower temperatures. Um, and we... We find to have there's less risk of the proteiny flavor that the enzyme can give you if we use it in fermentation rather than in the mash. If you're using it for a brute IPA, though, it has to be added in fermentation. Has to be added in fermentation, um, and that's to get it down to the brute levels. It does different. So yeah, it does slightly different things. So gluc glucoamylase as a uh, um, as a as a mash enzyme can work very well, especially if you're doing it on the lower end. Basically anything 152 and below, it'll work pretty well to help increase your efficiency, just making sure that you're maximizing your enzyme content regardless of grain bill. But during, uh, um, during fermentation, what it'll do, because it actually works at a really wide range during fermentation, it'll keep breaking down starches and it can get, you know, let's say you have a 1050 OG beer, it can get that down to one, like one, one. Which is Garage Brewing, thank you. I appreciate you uh, giving us a super chat. Yeah. Looks way different as it was brighter four months ago. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it <laughs> probably uh, had some know. new levels of fermentation in the in the fridge. We did keep it cold the entire time, though, so. Mm, no, that's wonderful. Oh, that's it's really good. Wonderful. Uh, Eric C. You say that was raspberry? Yeah. Yeah, because the, the, there's a uh, subtle, like, fruit bitterness, and I'm guessing it's the raspberry, like, raspberry skins or something like that, but little tannin from that yeah uh, that goes really well with hops whatever that that brightness is goes really well with the hops that are in there uh eric c the imperial harvest from six months ago if you were co-pitching that with brett just toss the whole darn thing in the dead cells the brett will eat those you're not gonna have to worry about the autolysis on that mm. if you chirp it you get a lot of like that puffiness too mm. The milkshake comes through. Raspberry milkshake sour IPA. Okay. This tastes a lot like one that we did um, mm. like seven or eight months ago. 
It wasn't raspberry, but it had the same berry. It, had, it was a sour milkshake IPA that had that same like. This is, I would say, I don't mm. know if it was a five gallon batch. I'd say this is higher on the on the lactose, like a pound and a quarter per five gallon batch, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was probably higher than what we did. But that thickness really works well with the fact that it's already sour and pretty dry. Yeah, so, that that's awesome. Delicious, absolutely. All right, uh, ooh, I'm missing a lot of stuff. Um, okay. Uh, shall we continue yeah. in the cold side? Let's finish up these uh, clarifiers, and then we'll go into some Q&A real quick. So uh, on the cold side, um, a couple of the most common ones that you saw before um, beer clarification on the homebrew scale came pretty popular were bentonite, sparkaloid, and gelatin. You probably see gelatin used a lot if you watch Brewlosophy, um, which we follow Brewlosophy pretty um, a lot. They're cool guys. Give them, give them a check out. Cool dudes. Um, so, but bentonite, uh, when it comes to cold side clarification, there's a couple things you're thinking about, namely pH and uh, uh, and uh, the charge of the clarifier that you're using. Revin KY, I just saw this. I can answer it quick. Chirping is breathing in while you were you have liquid in your mouth. You may hang on. If you can hear that, and what you're doing is your base. It it's huge in the wine world not as much in the beer world what you're doing is spreading it over your palate but you're also popping out some of the aromatics from the carbonation on the inside ah yeah jeff just got agitating in, in your there. mouth while incorporating some oxygen mm -hmm. yep. the oxygen is more important in the wine world than it is necessarily in the beer world but that's basically what it's doing it's letting you experience more complete flavors yeah so going on to oh, silifine, dem castles, silifine. That's going to be in our cold side uh, topic, actually. But let's start with bentonite. So bentonite is a classic negatively charged uh, um, fighting agent. It's more commonly used in the wine world because of the types of haze-forming compounds that are in there at wine pHs, which wine pHs with finished wine are generally a little bit lower than beer pHs. Mm -hmm. uh, bentonite comes from <coughs> clay, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. So... There we go. It's also got, uh, I want to say something that can grab onto longer chain, uh, more neutral um, <laughs> compounds, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, that it sounds right. That sounds right. Um, sparkloid. Sparkloid is a positive charge, and sparkloid was a really good charge. kind of medium between, <laughs> um, you know, the beer and wine world for a long time because uh, sparkloid works really well without removing a ton of flavoring compounds. And a lot of those... Uh, positively charged compounds can also hold some sort of flavor. So something like a bentonite can strip a lot of those out. Whereas a sparkloid um, where it was able to grab onto some negatively charged compounds that can cause haze without necessarily stripping flavor. Hmm. Are, you, are you reading something? Oh, no. Uh, well, I was laughing at Reverend KY. He calls <laughs> it bonging it. And, no. you know, yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, same sound. Yeah. Right. Uh, gelatin is actually a uh, unique one. Gelatin is actually um, negatively charged when the pH is higher than five, but it's positively charged when the pH is lower than five. So bentonite or gelatin uh, at beer pHs, finished beer pHs on the cold side, uh, gelatin um, will act more like a uh, chitosan, uh, more like a uh, sparkaloid. And at, on the high pH side, like if you were to add gelatin to, let's say, a boil, when in the pH is still above five, uh, adding gelatin to the boil, it'll act more like an Irish moss. Yeah. Uh, and then we have, well, um, well, you just mentioned it, the uh, Kytosan. So Kytosan is one of the ones that we use uh, on all our beers. Uh, uh, not sometimes. Not we, if we clarify <laughs> a beer, we generally are using a two-part uh, on that. And we'll get into the second part. Kytosan is one of them. If we can get a hold of it, that's been actually something that's been harder to get a hold of since shutdown and brewcraft not existing. Someone says uh, chirping expresses bready notes for me. Rough time noticing them otherwise. That, no. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. There's some sure. softer flavor compounds that come through with chirping. Um, certain aromatics come through. It also, there's different parts of your tongue that don't get exposed to beer if you just drink beer. So chirping is a really good way to fill your palate. And also, um, there's a part of the back of your mouth that is attached to what's it called like the 
So what was it, Jacobson organ or something like that? The organ that uh, has all your olfactory senses and stuff like that. Um, so it's connected to your nose, but it's not from your nose because your nose can sometimes filter out a lot of good aromatics. But that same organ uh, is in the back of your mouth, like on the top end. And so chirping can also have you smell and taste at the same time. Mm. All that aside, um, let's go into, so Kytosan is one of a two-stage two finding agent that we use in any beer that we want to basically get clarified quickly. If we're fermenting a beer that we want to get clarified on normal timeline, like lagering and stuff like that, then we won't really worry about most clarifiers, um, depending on the yeast that we use. But if we uh, are doing a clarifying, the common one that we do is Kytosan is our um, stage one clarifier, and then we'll use a silica finding agent as stage two. Kytosan, or Kiesel is one, and Kytosan is Kiesel salt, yeah, sorry. Kiesel reverse salt that. One. Strike yeah. that, reverse it. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's so, uh, and that two pit part is really nice because you're adding that positive and negative. Uh, the Kaizen, in my experience, um, oh, sorry, actually, that was the uh, Kielsa saw. We haven't got there. Uh, retract my statement till next section. <laughs> no, we can get there, yeah. Okay. Let's go, yeah, let's yeah. go in order. Silicas. Uh, silicas are a negative <clears throat> charge on that. The first one on there is Kielsasol. That is what we were talking about in our two part. Uh, that is our first stage, which is why I keep trying to talk about it. It's a negatively charged uh, ion on there, like the bentonite. I, in my experiences, I found it to be a little bit less aggressive than the bentonite, so it won't strip out. And this is my experiences, it may not be true, but it won't strip out as many flavor molecules as the actual bentonite will. Um, now again, that may not be true. That's my experience, it but is, it is also uh, vegan, which is why a lot of people use the silica finding agents. Cause, um, so a lot of breweries, if they're using one finding agent and one finding agent only will only use a silica finding agent because of the vegan quality. Yes. Uh, which is important, uh, on that. And these come from silicas. I mean, the Kaidozan, uh, comes from crab shells most of the time, I believe, um, it's a shellfish uh, thing on there. While it won't actually, uh, actually, I don't know that I can promise this. While we have never seen or heard of a negative reaction to somebody who is allergic to shellfish from Kaidozan, that may not necessarily be true. So don't kill yourself because I gave you bad information. Um, that being said, the silicas are vegan, and that, that is important to some people. So that's important to uh, actually for us to know as professional brewers because that matters. Yeah, uh, especially when you're doing um, some quality lobster beers where you want to make sure that they are vegan friendly. So, uh, you know, after your lobster beers Pes are almost done. Yeah, pescatarian. Kind of seems to be pescatarian too. <laughs> Anyways, Sorry, that's so evolved. That evolved. Kiesel's all biofine and uh, xylophine. Xylophine is a new cellar science one. And we actually started carrying xylophine in the, uh, uh, in the shop here. But those are all those vegan uh, negatively charged pH. And if you had to pick one over the other, most breweries will say pick the silica for that reason alone. But in terms of the most effective between that and kytosan, I actually think the kytosan by itself is more effective than biofine. Uh, in my experiences in the back, I would also agree with that. Also, I'm agreeing with Daniel. The, uh, the whatever organ you're trying to think of is yeah. now the G-spot <coughs> of the oral factory yeah. system. The G-spot of the olfactory system, yeah. And you can only reach that when you chirp your beers. And so uh, it's one of those – so that spot for smelling is actually better than your nose for smelling, and people don't realize that. Uh, John Booth, we did talk about Clarity Firm uh, a little bit further up in fermentation. Clarity Firm is a great way to go. Helps reduce gluten and everything. Uh, filters. This is not actually something that we added on here because we were mostly thinking about what you can add into your beer rather than use to uh, get clear beer. Filters uh, are a good way to go as well. Um, that being said, there, if you get too small on that, and I'm not entirely sure the actual micron size, but if you do get too small on your filters or too aggressive with them, you can start to strip out actual flavor from your beer. You can strip out hot particles and other things like that. So, And on the homebrew scale, I would say there's a lot of reasons to say on the homebrew scale that filters can be a risk as well because if you can't perfectly purge your filter system, even if you have a multi, like especially if you have a multi-stage, which is probably necessary for a perfect uh, 
like getting a beer bright right. in line. Mm -hmm. So you've got like, let's say you've got like a rough filter, then like a five micron, then like a one micron. Yeah. There's a lot of ways in there that oxygen can get picked up too. So there is also a risk for your final product. Yeah. Uh, and the final thing that I would probably say for clarifying, which uh, in my opinion is one of the best, unless it's an IPA, is time. Let your yeast fall out. Uh, time will clarify Let it do your its beer. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the beauties as a home brewer is <laughs> a lot of comments that we're ignoring on here have been saying is if you just let your beer sit for the proper amount of time, more than likely the yeast is going to fall out and you will have some bright, bright, delicious, clean beer. Um, as professional brewers, there's some of these things that we can't actually do. Uh, well, I shouldn't say can't because we do do it here. But. <clears throat> Most brewers do not want to sit and wait for that. That is, as a professional, that is money that you're sitting on. So a lot of these tricks help you out to get beers out quicker. Or maybe if you promise somebody beer by the Super Bowl and you started it last week, you know, you're using some clarifiers to make it clear, bright, and shiny. But time is great. Time will help develop those flavors a lot more naturally. It'll help condition your beer beautifully. Uh, if you can do it, that's my preferred method. Um, so 190 watching. We need four more likes for them to triple digits. Yeah. Let's get into triple digits. Let's get those 100 likes. Please, if you are watching, go ahead and give this video a like. Also, if you are watching, give our second channel a subscribe. So Genus Not Brewing, if we get to 1,000 subscribers by Tuesday, by Tuesday, Everyone who is subscribed, I will enter into a competition for a free Anvil Foundry, and I will mail it within the United States to anywhere. He's going to buy that personally, because <clears throat> if he doesn't, then he loses. Yeah, I, there, there, there's a bet going on to whether or not we can get that channel. Uh, <laughs> and I got the last pick of the options for how fast we get to 1,000 subscribers. So please, if you guys can uh, subscribe to that channel immediately, <laughs> I'll be doing a giveaway. 1,000 subscribers, if you're subscribed, you're in the giveaway for at anvil foundry and it's got to be by this tuesday if, if it's after this tuesday if it's after this tuesday wait for another 15 days and then subscribe and then ryan will give you something and not me i'm not ryan tim will give you oh you have 20 you're 20 oh yeah 20 so you've, you've got between, or wait till 25 days you've, uh, got, you've got between a range of a, a, well, I don't want gaming 18, to win. 18 to, so you've got 18 to 22 is your range, right? <laughs> day 18 to 22. We're on day four right now. So, day four. so yeah. Uh, the channel is called Good. Genus Nat Brewing. Uh, Reverend, thank you <clears throat> so much for that super chat. That's uh, awesome. Send us beer. Pressure fermented a Belgian strong ale and installed a new nitro tap. Oh, that sounds great. Uh, oh, yeah. Link, uh, our, can you link our second channel into this right now? I can do it. Or just maybe in a comment. Yeah. So stay tuned uh, for this awesome link of our second channel really quickly. It will be in the super chat. So you can all go and subscribe right now. Um, everyone who subscribes, I will give a literal dollar to. <laughs> I would like you all to subscribe because I really want to see him mail out all those dollars. Um <laughs> Yeast and the beast, what type of water are we using in our brewery? From the ground. Okay, real answer. Uh, we actually have very, very neutral water where we're at. We we're super lucky. Yeah, very low mineral content to it. We have almost a 7 pH. Come, uh, really good water pressure for that. So we normally, we treat our water almost as if uh, I would say that it's uh, German soft water. Uh, or Bavarian type of water, maybe Czech, not quite Czech, that's a lot lower, but Bavarian type of water, and we build our uh, water chemistries off of that. Uh, all right, let's, let's get, oh, oh, wow, 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 wow. Wow, 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 wow. There's, oof, getting on there. Grams of uh, Ascorbix, you spelled that wrong, Ascorbix, uh, for a five-gallon IPA batch. Um, Three to five. I, uh, and back in the brewery here, I use about 10 grams per barrel. Uh, we also have closed systems. Everything is transferred under CO2 and it never sees oxygen. So you should probably add a little bit more. 
Subscribe. Ah, breakfast beer. Yeah. yeah, watch all our new Willet beers. We'll be going to that second channel, by the way. Um, we want to get those Willet beers out there on a different platform. That's the reason for starting the second channel in the first place, because we put so much effort into them, and they don't get the attention they deserve on this channel, so we want them to stand alone. So, yeah, entertainment channel, second channel. Go subscribe we right also, now. We also don't want to dilute the information that you guys are getting on this channel. Yeah. With stuff that we believe is really fun, and we also think you enjoy it, but you also don't need to search through, you know, a bunch of videos of us judging beer to get to your info video. So head to Genus Not Brewing, and then you can watch us drink and rate light crappy beer. I keep getting a sort of soapy quality to my hot forward beers. What causes this, and how can I avoid it? Um, depends on the beers. A lot of those soapy qualities can come from um, there's high... Uh, there's beers that are designed to be more soapy or hops that are designed to be more soapy, like Cascade. So a Cascade in a Whirlpool is like a very, very soapy flavor. Um, Centennial, same way. So it could be the hops that you're using. Uh, could also be how you're dry hopping, kind of depending on the base of your beer. But uh, that's one of those questions that, other than those two things, it's hard to kind of pick out what could be the culprit. Yeah, there's a few things on that. Um Bicarbonates, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, bicarbonate uh, concern for RO, RO water to increase alkalinity for dark beers, or is there a flavor benefit as well? There's a flavor benefit as well. Bicarbonates will change uh, the mouthfeel, the minerality to your water, as well as actually add a little bit of pretzely saltiness, depending on the amount. A lot of people don't actually realize that uh, bicarbonates have a texture to them, and so when you see people trying to balance their chlorides and sulfates um, and trying to get that kind of balanced profile in the water and their water, they don't necessarily um, think about bicarbonates. And so you see a lot of water profiles that have zero bicarbonates in them, but it's important for mouthfeel. Uh, if you get a zero bicarbonate water profile in a relatively like, let's say hot forward beer that has an aggressive minerality in the calcium and the sulfate and all that, then sometimes it can come across really, really thin. It can come across like almost watery. So bicarbonates kind of help build texture and body to the beer as well. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a good one. Professor Crackers asked how to make it gluten-free or gluten-reduced. Uh, since it's pertinent to a couple of things we were talking about, we'll talk about the gluten-reduced. Gluten-free make beer without <coughs> gluten. Um, there's millet and uh, sorghum and a couple other gluten-free grains that you can do that with. But what we're going to talk about is a gluten reduced because you could make, you'd have to test it, but you could theoretically make a almost two gluten free beer with barley with some of these enzymes. Uh, you do have to keep the malt content fairly low. I think it's, uh, what is it? It's right about a 4% beer um, that we were looking at. You're using the clarity firm on that. You're using some enzymes in the mash side. Uh, I would probably also use uh, the ultra firm or the glucoamylase in the fermentation side. And basically what you need to do is make sure that there's no starches left because that's where that gluten will live. And then with all of these, I mean, not the only place. Okay. Not, you know, not super scientific here. Well, he is. That's why he does that. Uh, but while doing those things, you can theoretically make an almost zero gluten beer because you have converted all of that over into sugars, which have now been fermented out by the yeast. To make sure of that, you would have to test it. So, you know, feed it to a celiac uh, and see if they <laughs> that's, die. That's the only way to test. <laughs> that's the only way. It's not like there's labs or anything, maybe a starch test. But... Uh, you know, that is a great way to make gluten reduced beers is uh, combining these enzymes to really convert everything over into sugars and ferment it out. I have seen studies where there are breweries that have t sent some of their light lagers, for example, to a, a lab to test the gluten content. And the glu gluten content in those beers have been lower than, um, you know, lower than celiac levels uh, like from mm -hmm. the National Celiac Board. Um, and uh, the reason being is just how, how those uh, different starches flocculate, how the gluten protein specifically um, is grabbed onto and flocculated. And so super clear beers generally are going to be lower in, in gluten than not super clear beers. Um, but it's definitely possible to make a 
gluten-free friendly beer that's done with normal brewing methods, even with barley. Yeah. All right, close out. Tell everyone to subscribe to the second channel, not this channel. Move your subscriptions over there. Whatever it takes to get me to win. Move your, uh, not move. Subscribe to both of them. All right. So uh, we got to get opened up here. It looks like there's somebody who's going to be knocking on our door pretty soon. They can wait outside for a minute. Um, thank you for tuning in. We enjoyed having you here. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can uh, in comments and everything. Subscribe to this channel, smash that like button, all the good stuff. Subscribe to Genus Not Brewing either within four days or you need to wait for at least like 18 to 20 days. Those are the time spans. It's now or 15 days from now. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We love you all. Bye.